Hi everyone, it's Pastor Sherwin. Thank you so much for watching this and for worshiping Jesus together with us today. It's our hope and our prayer that you, no matter where you may be in your faith journey, that today, that you'd encounter Jesus through the various elements of our video worship service, through the singing, through the prayers, through God's word being read and taught. You'd encounter Jesus, and if you don't know him, that you'd hear the word about Jesus today, and you'd place your faith in him, and that you would know him as your Savior. For those of you who do know Jesus, that you grow more and more deeply in love and understanding of Jesus and what he's done for you, that you trust him, that you'd obey him for his glory. So to that end, let me pray for us as we begin our worship service today. Let's pray. Our God in heaven, we do come to you and we want to give to you the worship that you and you alone deserve. Thank you for Jesus. It's by him and through him and in him that we have bold confidence to approach you and give you our praise today. Father, as we spend time with you right now, we pray that you'd feed our minds with your truth, that you would fill our hearts with your grace, and that you would empower us now to worship you in spirit and in truth. And all this, God, we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Our call to worship today comes from Psalm 73, and it's going to be verses 25 through 28. Hear now, God, through his word, his calling, inviting, and gathering word to us today. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there's nothing on earth that I, that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, those who are far from you shall perish. You put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. But for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of all your works. Amen. Let's all sing together now. You're all together lovely, 
altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to me. Amen. Our elders have called our church to a month of prayer and fasting. It's a month where we as a church will intentionally withhold from certain things for a period of time for the spiritual purpose of strengthening our prayer life and for deepening our pursuit of God. And to that end, we are assembling each week a prayer guide as a help for the month. It's a guide that we hope many of you will use and would you, you know, join with us as we pray for certain things together. A prayer guide is released at the beginning of each week. Last week, uh, in the prayer guide, we highlighted certain things for us to lament and to grieve over together. And you can find that prayer guide linked for you in the description section below. You know, when it comes to lament, one of the great prayers of lament we see in the Bible is Psalm 13. And in Psalm 13, we see a couple of things. One thing we see is what one author calls holy complaint. The Psalm starts, How long, O Lord? Will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? And what the scripture clearly knows is that we live in a fallen world. We live in a world where the curse of sin has seeped into every corner of our lives and every part of our existence. Death is literally all around us. And so we do mourn, we grieve, we weep, we cry out. When will this end? When will this stop? When you will you, O oh God, finally put things right? How long must this go on? It's holy complaint. But another thing we see in Psalm 13, it's not just holy complaint, but hopeful, hopeful complaint. This is what the psalmist says at the end of Psalm 13. But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. And what's so amazing is we see that when the psalmist and as the psalmist turns to God, turns to the Lord from his grief and hardship, in the midst of his grief and hardship, the Holy Spirit shows up, right? And it's not magic. It's what happens when God's people turn to and latch on to God. And they find him as a refuge. And the Holy Spirit renews hope and he strengthens trust in the God who really is there, the God who is there. So we're going to pray right now using last week's prayer guide. Let's pray together and entrust hard things and broken things to a loving and powerful Heavenly Father together. You'll see the prayer points on the screen as I pray. Would you follow along with me as I lead us together in prayer? Let's pray. Lord, hear our cries. We feel so small and helpless in the face of these great evils and so much brokenness. So we cry out to you, God. How long, O oh Lord, will this pandemic continue? This pandemic that claims lives and rips loved ones away from families each and every day. How long, O oh Lord, must we wait until we can finally pee with our loved ones, our family, our friends and community without quarantining, without masks, without distancing, without hindrance, and without fear? How long, O oh Lord, must minorities in our country face dirty looks, or hear degrading comments, or receive unfair treatment, or suffer hatred and violence on a daily basis? How long, O oh Lord, will your church continue to idolize politics and prize the differences that divide us rather than cherish the unity that you sent your son Jesus to die for, the unity that we have with you, God, and also with one another? How long, O oh Lord, must children, children in our neighborhood, our cities, our nation, thrust into the season, the season of pandemic and sickness, and disease, and racial injustice, and racial violence, how long will children have to face images and reckon with questions that are overwhelming 
for their young, innocent minds, and even breaking to their spirits. How long, O Lord, will people's livelihoods and education continue to be on ice and even fall through with no upturn in sight? How long, O Lord, will our brothers and our sisters around the world be hated and be hurt simply because they claim the name of Jesus? O Lord, would you, in the midst of all these things, hear us, hear our cries? Would you protect us, protect our loved ones, preserve us in these evil days? God, would you make things right? And would you bring your justice to your world quickly, Sovereign Lord? God, we trust you. We know you love us. And we know that your love, unlike ours, it never fails. And we know that no matter what life throws at us, no matter how deep the pit we find ourselves in, no matter how dark the prison, in Jesus, because of Jesus, you've given us a living hope and an invincible joy that nothing, not even death, and no amount of darkness can take away. God, you have been so good to your people for countless generations. God, we worship you, and we will sing of your mighty deeds and your glorious grace forever. And even as we now turn our attention to the hearing and the preaching of your word, God, we need your help. And we ask you, Holy Spirit, to help us illumine the words and the pages of Scripture to our dark and tired souls. Help us to see Jesus and run to him as he's proclaimed and held forth to us from your word. Help us to trust him and obey him. Would you use Pastor Jonathan? Would you help us now as we hear his word? And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey everyone, it's Pastor Jonathan. Uh, again, I wanna welcome you to this virtual Grace and Peace worship service. Uh, if you're not a member of Grace and Peace, if you're a guest with us, we warmly welcome you today. And especially if you're not yet a, a believer and follower of Jesus Christ, we are super glad that you're with us. This worship service is not just for believers and followers of Jesus. This worship service is for you as well. Everyone needs to hear the good news about Jesus. And I hope and I have prayed already that today would be the day that you hear the good news of Jesus, believe in it, become one of his followers. And we're going to learn about Jesus today from the Gospel of John. That's the portion of the Bible we'll be studying. The Gospel of John, chapter 9, big number in the Bible, verses 1 through 17, the little numbers in the Bible. John chapter 9, verses 1 through 17. Uh, those verses will be on the screen for you, as will be a response after I read God's word. So let's now hear God's word as it comes to us today from John chapter 9, verses 1 through 17. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it, it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said these things, he spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So he went and washed and came back seen. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, It is he. Others said, No, but he is like him. He kept saying, I am the man. So they said to him, Then how were your eyes opened? He answered, The man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to, said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, Where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. And now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. So the Pharisees again asked him how he had received his sight. And he said to them, he put mud on my eyes and I washed and I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. 
But others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. So they said again to the blind man, what do you say about him since he has opened your eyes? He said, he is a prophet. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Well, now I see. Uh, from time to time, I will mention in the sermon that I have a, a degenerative eye disease. I wear uh, two contacts in each eye, one hard contact and one soft contact. And, you know, there was a time when I only wore hard lenses that I did not take care of those hard lenses whatsoever. In fact, I took such bad care of them that they actually began to get foggy. And so not only did I not see well without them in, I actually didn't see very well with them in. They were foggy and they were outdated by way of prescription. By God's grace, I realized I really need to take care of my eyes. My eyesight is very important in general, especially for being a pastor. It's important to be able to preach my sermons and look at my notes uh, while I'm doing so. And I realized I needed to take care of my eyes and I got new clean lenses with an updated prescription. And I can remember, I can remember when I first put them in, I, I could see, I could see color and I could see details. I could see like I never had before, literally. And you know, the phrase I can see can also refer to, oh, now I get it. Now I understand it. I can see. And both of those meanings of I can see is what we find today in our passage. We come to the story of a man who sees physically for the very first time in his life, but he also has an understanding. He sees in his heart who Jesus is as the prophet of God, all because of Jesus' illuminating grace in his life. And by way of outline today, we see in verses 1 through 7, illumination that's divine. Verses 1 through 7, illumination that's divine. And next we see in verses 8 through 12, illumination that's defended. Illumination that is defined. Illumination that's defended. And then in verses 13 through 17, we see illumination that's divisive. Illumination that's divine. Illumination that's defended. And illumination that's divisive. Now, here in John chapter 9, we come to one of my favorite, very favorite stories in the whole Bible. We're going to be studying it the next three weeks. And one of the reasons why it's uh, one of my favorite stories is you see amazing grace, the grace of illumination given to this man who was born blind. But then you also see amazing perseverance by this man. Now, Jesus had just told uh, the Jews that before the great father of their faith, Abraham, was even born, he said, I am, unequivocally saying, I am God. And the Jews got it because they wanted to stone him for this so-called blasphemy. But he snuck out of the temple, the setting of where that conversation was taking place, uh, the holy place of worship for the Jews. He snuck out of the temple in order to avoid death. And what we come to today is what followed that event first, we see illumination that's divine. Again, verses 1 through 7. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said these things, he spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. Now, after Jesus had left the temple, uh, he would go by someone who was born blind. Now, we need to note something here. Jesus went by this man who was born blind. He could see the man, but the man born blind, of course, couldn't see Jesus. He was blind. And this is a picture of you and me and every single person 
who's born into this world. We are born spiritually blind. We are born spiritually dead, the Bible says, all because of our sin within us. We are naturally unable to see Jesus. We can only come to Jesus, seeing him with the eyes of our hearts, seeing him with our very heart of hearts. The only way we can see him is if he first comes to us just like he does this man born blind. If he reveals himself, if his divine illumination of grace comes to us. Now, secondly, Jesus is not told here that the man is born blind and he doesn't need to be told that the man is born blind. Jesus, as we studied last week, is the great I am. He is God. He knows all things. He perfectly knows this man's situation and story. Jesus, as God, has written this man's story. And in that story, and in the writing of that story, it includes coming to him with illuminating grace. And so Jesus' followers say to him, Rabbi, master, teacher, leader, the one that we go to to, to get understanding is this guy blind because of his sin or because his parents sin? They're seeking a, a kind of a knowledge of an understanding of cause and effect. What is the cause of the effect of this man's blindness? What is the cause? And they think it's sin. They're assuming it is sin. Now, of course, it's not wrong to seek cause and effect, but suffering and brokenness in this world is never as simple to understand as we would like. They think it's simply sin. This is the reason for this man's condition, his blindness. They're connecting the dot of suffering to a direct line to another dot of sin. Now, it is certainly true. The Bible has many things to say. There are certain dots that are connected as it relates to our sin and certain results. In Numbers chapter 14, Verse 18, we have these words. He, speaking of God, will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 reads, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. There are indeed severe and monumental consequences to our sins and the sins of of others. Sin always has a greater negative impact on us and on others than any of us fully realizes. But not all human suffering in the world is a direct result of a sin choice. We live in a fallen and broken world because of sin. That's God's curse on sin. God has cursed us and cursed the world because of sin. Or maybe we'd say we cursed ourselves because we've fallen into sin. Nothing is the way it ought to be. Nothing. No situation, no person. Nothing is the way it ought to be because of sin and the fallenness and the broken nature of this life because of it. Now, note this guy couldn't have even been born blind because of his sin unless he sinned in the womb somehow. And that's what caused him to be born blind. And notice something else too, when the disciples mention, hey, ask, hey, who sinned, this man or his parents that he was born blind? Notice there's, a, there's something that's missing here, and that's God. God is not even in the equation of their curiosity. And it'd be good for us to, to ask ourselves when we think about our suffering and the suffering of other people, do we think merely it is because of the bad sin choice of another person, the bad sinful life choice that we have made or that someone else has made, that we or they suffer, it certainly can be. We reap what we sow, but that is not our only option, that there is hardship and suffering in the world. Because Jesus says here, well, look, it wasn't either this man's sin or his parents' sin that has caused his blindness. The whole purpose of this man's blindness was so that God's work would be displayed in him. This man has sort of been, and this may sound hard, 
to, to accept, entrusted with this particular suffering of blindness so that God could show off his grace in him. This man's affliction with blindness was a platform for God's grace. It's so understandably counterintuitive to how we think about suffering. It may be that we even begin to question God's goodness when we think about what Jesus is saying here. Suffering and the sovereignty of God, God being in control, is not an easy thing for finite, sinful minds to get our minds around. Just to say the least, it's not easy. And there are many helpful resources out there. In fact, we sent one to the Grace and Peace family earlier this week in our weekly news and notes email. And there are many more resources out there as well. You'll see my email address and Pastor, email, uh, Pastor Sherwood's email address here as well. Please make use of those email addresses uh, if you'd like some resources about suffering and the sovereignty of God. We'd love to get those to you. Now, maybe you know on paper that your suffering or someone else's suffering, maybe physical suffering like we see here with this man born blind, it's been purposed by God for his honor in you or in that other per person. But you struggle, you struggle because you just don't see how God is honored. It is an intolerable suffering, seemingly, and you just want it gone. Let me say to you, that is completely understandable. And it is understandable to want things whole, the way they ought to be in a perfect world. In fact, it's actually evidence that you're an image bearer of God, that God has made you, because you know things ought to be right and whole. You know when something is off and it's wrong. It reflects that we've been made by God. And so I wanna encourage you to pray to God when there is suffering that seems intolerable and you just want to go and pray. Lord, help me to understand. Help me to get what you want me to understand. What are you teaching me through this? And you are also free to pray for that suffering to be gone. The great early church leader, the Apostle Paul, wrote these words in 2 Corinthians 12. So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. You know, the followers of Jesus in John chapter 9 appeared to have a, a kind of godless, uh, a God-empty, void view of suffering. But Paul's view of his own suffering, even when he didn't receive relief from it, was God full. How are your thoughts on suffering, either yours or, or someone else's, godless? What does that look like, that it's godless? What does it look like for it to be God full? How are your thoughts on suffering, God full, God being in it, albeit mysteriously. And if so, what does that mean for how you live in light of it? Again, whether it's your suffering or someone else's. And then Jesus goes on to say in verses four and five, look, we need to be busy with God's work. I'm about to be really busy with God's work. We need to be busy with God's work while it's still day, while I'm still around, because night is coming when I'm not going to be here any longer. Life as you know it, and this is the meaning for us, the application for us, life as we know it is not going to be forever. We must shine the light of the gospel now. There will be a day when we can no longer get God's good work of the gospel out to others. There'll be no more opportunity for people to hear it. And so we need to speak it into the darkness of our day, of the sin of our day and the racism of our day and the hatred of our day and the anger of our day and the biases of this day and the injustices of today, the false gods of success, the false god of appearance, the false god of political triumphalism and the false god of superiority, which comes from pride. We need to speak the good news 
into those things today because Jesus says, as long as I'm here, I'm the light of the world. I have come so that people can see. And hundreds of years before Jesus was on the scene as a man, it was prophesied what he would come to do in Isaiah 35. Say to those who have an anxious heart, do you have an anxious heart? Listen, say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. Jesus has come to reverse the curse of God because of our sin and to make all things new and right, to bring illuminating grace, making things the way they ought to be just like we see here with this man. Because in front of the disciples who could see and this man who could not see, Jesus shows off that he's the great I am, the light of the world, the illuminator, as he spits on the ground, turns dust into mud. And then he think this is reflective of being recreated in Jesus Christ. We were created out of dust, God breathing life into dust. And there was humanity and Jesus spits on the ground and brings new life, as it were, to this man. He spits on the ground and makes mud and anoints this man's eyes with that mud, tells him to wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent, the sent one is sending this man to this pool to wash in order to receive sight for the very first time because he did it. He went to the pool, he washed it off, and he could see for the very first time in his life, color, details, People, he could see all because of Jesus' miraculous, illuminating, divine touch of grace. And this points us to the great illumination of God's grace on a cross, where Jesus, the sinless man, hung there, being judged by God the Father, the one who sent him into the world to accomplish the very mission on the cross that he did, dying for the sins of people like you and me, taking on the punishment and judgment of God, the eternal punishment and judgment of God for people like you and me. He was punished as the innocent God-man, breathing his last, put to death, buried into a tomb. And then three days later, he was raised from the grave and he was triumphant over sin and over death for all eternity, for anyone who will say, I believe in him as my personal Lord and Savior. I believe that he came here for me and that he lived perfectly for me and that he died as a substitute for me and he was buried for me and he was raised for me that I might be raised with him forever. This is the good news. And this miracle here of Jesus touching this man's eyes with anointing his eyes with mud, with recreating this man by giving him sight, it points to the ultimate healing that Jesus brings to humanity, to the nations of the world for any individual who will trust in him, a healing, an eternal healing with God. Sins forgiven forever because Jesus died and was raised. That is illumination that's divine if you've seen and if you've believed. Well, next we see illumination that's defended. This poor man is having now to defend himself, and he will continue to do so even into next week. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, it is he. Others said, no, but he is like him. He kept saying, I am the man. So they said to him, then how were your eyes opened? He answered, the man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, where is he? He said, I don't know. Now the neighbors, the neighborhood was well aware of what was uh, shaking down. And so they asked, hey, is this the neighborhood beggar? Uh, it was not easy to get a job, not as easy in the first century to get a to job. A job, if you were blind, uh, it's a little bit easier uh, today, but it wasn't so easy then. So you would beg in order to get money if you didn't have any family or if your family had cashed you out because you were blind, which sadly did happen. And maybe that was the situation with this man. Who do you see outside of Wawa, the gas station, or that man or woman at the end of your street who begs? That's this man. 
Think of those people. That's this man. And as with this man, so too those people outside of Wawa and the, the grocery store or down your street, well, they have a story too. And part of that story is that like this man, they are made in God's image with dignity. How do you think of them? How do you think of this man here? How do you think the disciples in the neighborhood thought of him? A beggar they want to avoid, a beggar you want to avoid, or an image bearer just like you who has needs just like you. Your needs may be covered up a little bit more with money or education or sophistication, but you have needs just like this beggar. Now, some of the neighbors say, hey, it's him. It's the neighborhood beggar. Others say, no, it's not him. But it's someone who's, who's like him, you know, just another beggar. And of course, this man can hear the, the neighbor's uh, identification of him as just a beggar. But he's saying, look, it is me. I'm that guy. Yes, it's me. And they say, well, look, okay, if it's you, how do you receive your sight? And so he tells them. He testifies. He says, the man known as Jesus, he made mud. He anointed my eyes. He told me to wash, and I did, and now I see. Now I can see. And of course, the neighbors react. There was a miracle, but they didn't react because there was a miracle. There was no praise the Lord, or we're so happy for you, or what? This is amazing. No, they just say, well, where is he? They may want to corroborate this man's account of the story, with Jesus telling of the story, they want to see if things match up, see if this really did happen the way this guy said so. So he's stuck saying, look, I don't know. I don't know where he is, seemingly all alone, to celebrate Jesus illuminating grace in his life. And we'll see more of that next week. This guy really is alone, even when it comes to his family. Now, we might get this uh, ourselves. <laughs> Seemingly no one to really celebrate what God's doing in my life. You might feel alone. Jesus is at work in you. Maybe worse, maybe not worse, but equally as bad, we contribute to others feeling this way by not celebrating God's grace in them. How might you act more like these neighbors than a celebrator of God's grace in people's life? Maybe we spend more time questioning and coveting and doubting rather than celebrating. Maybe we even question or doubt if Jesus can even restore or save a certain person. So we don't pray. We certainly don't anticipate celebrating. How or who might this be true for you? We're not even sure if Jesus would do this, if this person could be rescued and healed and changed. And so we don't pray. And we don't anticipate celebrating. This man is defending himself. He's celebrating Jesus illuminating, illuminating grace all by himself. At last, we see that Jesus illuminating grace is also divisive. Watch this. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now, it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. So the Pharisees again asked him how he had received his sight. And he said to them, he put mud on my eyes and I washed and I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God. This is speaking about Jesus. He's not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. So they said again to the blind man, what do you say about him since he has opened your eyes? He said, he is a prophet. So the neighbors led this man to the Pharisees. Those were the, the Jewish leaders who uh, made applications to the law of God. Here's how you live it. We're going to hold you accountable to live it this way, our way, because we live it this way. Uh, the neighbors are getting the authorities involved now, maybe to help interpret what's going on, or maybe out of fear because the Pharisees wanted Jesus dead. And so any kind of association with him would be very dangerous. Again, we're going to see more of that next week as well. Now we've given a new detail here. The healing occurred on Saturday, on the Sabbath, the Jews' holy day when they were to do no work. And no work included countless, countless things, including not even needing the kneading of bread. And some say that Jesus 
turning this dust into mud with his saliva would fall under that category needing bread. Now we've seen the Jews reaction to Jesus healing on the Sabbath before back in John chapter five. And this was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things, another healing, he was doing these things on the Sabbath. So just as the neighbors, the Pharisees now questioned this poor man, how do you receive your sight? He had to answer and justify Jesus' work in him once again, seemingly all by himself with no one to celebrate, not his neighbors and not the Jewish leaders. So he tells him, he says the same thing he said to his neighbors in verse 15, here's what Jesus did and now I see. So the Pharisees heat is now turned up a little bit some are wanting to utterly discredit Jesus. Look, this guy is not from God. There's no way this guy is from God. He's not keeping the Sabbath. He's a false prophet. And ultimately, therefore, he needs to die, which was the consequence of being a false prophet for misleading God's people and misrepres misrepresenting God. But others interesting of the Pharisees say, well, wait, hold on now, time out. If he's a sinner, if he's a lawbreaker, how in the world can he perform such a sign as this, making this man born blind now able to see? To see, And so there's division amongst the leaders, which of course is never good. And probably a fresh reminder to pray against division and for unity with your grace and peace leaders, especially in this trying season. But because they're divided, they then look at the man, put him on the spot and say, well, what do you say of him? He's under crazy pressure here, and he says, he's a prophet. He is a prophet. That is a prophet from God, which we've already seen others testify to in Jesus, about Jesus in John chapter 4, the woman at the well who was sexually promiscuous, whom Jesus showed great grace to, said, the woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. She was speaking to Jesus. And then after Jesus multiplied five loaves of bread and two fish in order to feed 5,000 people, when the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet who's come into the world. And now this man is testifying that Jesus is a prophet. And this is profoundly bold of this man because of the danger he could be in. Now, maybe he was blissfully ignorant of the controversy surrounding Jesus so he's just answering the question, but it was still dangerous. You see, Jesus' illuminating grace had led him to testify about who Jesus is. Even if it wasn't popular, even if it was dangerous, as is true for so many Christians in the world today. What about you? What about you? Has Jesus healed you? Has he brought illuminating grace to the, eye, grace to the eyes of your heart? Has he saved you? from eternal condemnation due to you because of your sin? Has he rescued you by his grace? Has he shown you who he is, Lord and Savior of the world, the great illuminator of saving grace if you will trust in him? Do you see who he is? Do you see him as God coming to the world as a man as well and living and dying and being buried and being raised for you? Is he your personal Lord and Savior? If not, say yes to him today. I see him by faith. He's shown me who he is. I believe that he lived and died and was raised from the grave for me. And I now want to live for him, including testifying to others about him. How does his illuminating grace lead you to testify to him, about him? To whom does his illuminating grace lead you to testify to? Our healing by his grace, our healing by his illuminating grace, our salvation and ability to see who he is as Lord and Savior is not just about us, but about others as well. Believer, if you, have been, if you believe by God's grace, then you are called to share. Even when we feel alone, like there's no one else to back up our testimony. Even when we feel alone, we're never alone because Jesus says to his people, I am with you now by his spirit. I am with you even to the end of the age. My illuminating grace is with you even to the end of the age. Make me known to your neighbors and to the nations. Let's pray. Living God, Lord Jesus Christ,
We praise you as the only illuminator of the human soul, and we thank you for the illuminating grace of your gospel, of your good news. Lord, as we long for healing in so many different situations in this life, would you please help us to be content with your grace in all things? It is sufficient. So we pray, Holy Spirit, you'd give us grace to believe so. And we pray that you would give us the joy and courage to bear witness to who you are, Lord Jesus, to this broken and sin-cursed world that people might see and be saved. To that end, we pray for our financial giving this week as a church. Would you grant us joy? Would you grant us a sense of privilege in participating in your work in the world? And would you give our leadership wisdom as we seek to spend your money for your glory? All to the praise of your glorious and illuminating grace. And we pray in the matchless and mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen and amen. Just a couple of housekeeping items I want to keep before you as we move towards the conclusion of our service. First of all, as you heard Pastor Jonathan pray, uh, you can give to the work of the Lord here at Grace and Peace online, and you'll find the link listed right here and also linked in the description section below. Please do partner with us financially as we seek to make the gospel known here in our neighborhood and also abroad in the world. Secondly, we have a church app and a website that we're constantly updating. Uh, please check those things out if you have not yet. We are updating them with resources and information that we hope we will find useful to you in this season where we're not yet regathering and in a season where it's very difficult to know how to follow Lord Jesus Christ. There's lots of resources there for you. Please do check it out. Thirdly and finally, if there is any way that we can be of service to you, perhaps a question you have from something you've heard today, or maybe just a question or concern you've always had about God or the Bible or Christians, whatever it may be, please do know that Pastor Jonathan and myself, we would love to connect with you. You can find our email addresses right here. Uh, if you reach out to us, please do know that we would love to respond and engage with you. So with all that being said, let's together sing one final song this day.
so good to sing together. I'm glad we've been able to sing and to pray today and to study God's word together. Uh, please join us again uh, next week for this virtual Grace and Peace worship service. Invite others uh, if you're able to as well, especially those who maybe don't have a personal relationship with Jesus uh, and maybe who wouldn't want to step into the doors of a church building. Please invite them. Uh, as Pastor said, if you have any questions, if you want prayer, if you want to talk about having a relationship with Jesus or really anything, you see our email addresses below. Please email us. We'd love to connect with you. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to pray with and for you. Well, as we move out of this worship service and we enter into a new and unused week, let's receive God's final words to us in this worship service today. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. And all of God's people said, Amen.